Hey everybody, thank you for coming to the Senior Symposium of 2018. Today we have Julius Nevin presenting, and uh, he's presenting about machine learning in bioinformatics um, to understand transposable elements. And his advisor was Dr. Nicole Redswell. Hi everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, so my presentation today was exploring a problem, a big data bioinformatics problem using newfangled machine learning and TensorFlow. My advisor was Dr. Radswell and she helped me immensely. So kind of the science behind it, for those who have never heard of a transposable element, it's basically a sequence of DNA that literally moves itself and reinserts within a strand of a whole genome uh, and causes chromosomal breakage and it makes phenotypes and mutations. Uh, they were discovered a long time ago, but they're still studied to this day. They play a large role in gene regulation and gene expression, um, genome expression, and based on the location of insertion. Understanding transposable elements are crucial to understanding a genome, but they're extremely hard to understand because there's so many kinds of them. Excuse me, so many kinds of them. Uh, they're organized into two classes. The class one are basically picture, copy, and paste. Class two, which this project focused on, are DNA based, and they literally excise themselves, cut, and paste. Um, they're hard to understand because they're just so caught up in a lot of nucleotide noise over years of mutations. So I was aiming to try to uh, understand a smarter analysis of the class two activated dissociative family of TEs utilizing uh, a corn genome maze, Zia maze. So this is a transposon. Um, it codes for its own transposes, which is a protein that allows for the movement of these elements. Um, and on the either side is a terminal inverse repeat, which is basically just a strand of genetic code that's on one side looks like this, on the other side is flipped and looks like this. Um, and so they were discovered by Barbara McClintock in 1951. She's a celebrated geneticist, and during her whole life, she was studying maize genomes. Uh, she was looking at why corn has such a random color pattern, and she thought, there's gotta be something going on, because each corn is different based on its seedling. Uh, and so she proposed jumping genes. And at first, everyone thought she was crazy. And then back in the 80s, uh, she was awarded the Nobel Prize of Medicine for that year based on her discovery. So the ACGS system is composed of two different elements, an activator and a dissociator, a dissociation element. Um, the autonomous element, the activator, uh, codes for its own transposase. And when a dissociation element is in the proximity of an activator, it also can use the transposase and be moved down. The dissociation elements cannot move themselves. So this is basically what they look like. Uh, you can see that the DS is missing a transposase gene. And when this works in a system, uh, when it gets inserted, it breaks up the, gen the strand of genetic code and makes two sticky ends, which basically just overhang. The transposase is inserted, and then polymerase comes in and basically glues it in and makes the complement sequent on top. So this is one of the features we can look for, a target site duplication. You can see here and here is the exact same. Uh, they always flank transposase, transposable elements. Um, and then when they're excised out uh, and moved again, what remains behind is two direct repeats of the TSDs, and that's another clue we can use to find these elements after they're long gone. So in a corn genome, basically, uh, with a dissociator and an activator, if there's no activator nearby, the dissociation can't move, a g uh, allele, a gene is uninterrupted, and you get, for example, in this case, a white corn kernel. In this example, with an activator element nearby, the dissociation element can move in and interrupt the color gene, and you wind up getting two different alleles, a dominant and a recessive. The dominant is interrupted, the recessive uh, is expressed, and you get a black kernel. In this example, when the dissociation insert is can go into the middle of the gene. It interrupts the gene, but it causes a mutant phenotype that has spots. Sometimes, you can have a dissociation element jump right back out, the gene is now uninterrupted, and you get a white kernel instead. That's just how she discovered uh, part of these genes, looking at the color genes of maize. Um, so the DS elements are basically just activator elements that have lost its own transposase coding region. And over millions of years, all of these moving dissociation elements mutate and degrade, and they clutter up a whole genome. The maize genome is about it's millions of base pairs long, and almost 85% of it is consistent of just transposable elements. So it's really hard to identify these mutated transposable elements throughout all the noise. They've lost a lot of their identifying features. It's extremely hard to find them. 
So how do you classify and find these function these uh, once functional elements that have lost all their kind of context clues saying, oh, we used to be a ACDS element, but now we don't look anything like it. And the solution is a pipeline. And a pipeline is basically just a process, usually starting with a database, that takes you through using different software applications to solve a bioinformatics problem. There's, they can be anything, but it's just a string of programs and approaches to solve a problem. So my objectives followed along this pipeline approach, creating a database, using the machine learning neural network to train an algorithm to identify these features, searching these features against known elements, and then the last goal was not accomplished today, but it's on the right track to actually take it a step further with machine learning to train an SVM for classification, a simple vector machine. So the first goal was database creation. Um, a lot of these databases for maze transposable elements were out of commission, they lost funding. So this one research paper by um, this group of researchers in 2011 went in and identified all of the ACDS elements that they found and posted their research in the public domain. So they had all these outlined, they had a lot of the um, information about them which was really helpful for me. So I went in and I took their Excel file that was really hard to navigate and I made it into a R Shiny application database. And you can see here, now I can search it by chromosome, insertion site, annotation, and I get all the information I want and I can look through it quickly. The next goal was to sniff out the motifs themselves. Uh, so part of this was enabled by Kamers. Kamers are basically just the short sequences that make up a, a strand. It's a way to break them down and then walk the line so you get the whole sequence back. It's a little complicated, so I can show it out. This is a sixmer. You can split them into any size, but it takes a 15 base pair sequence or any size sequence, and you split it up, and when you walk the line, you get the whole sequence. Um, so the machine learning approach took a algorithm that a researcher at Cornell wrote called DNA to vector, which was based off the very popular word to vector algorithm for TensorFlow, and it basically compute it breaks down the whole genetic code that you give it into variable length cameras that you set. Um, and so I set it to five and twelve because these transposable elements had certain size features that were telltale signs, and so I wanted to keep them within the range that it could sniff them out. Um, and I trained it on two and a half million base pairs of maize, the assembly, and I picked a region that was within an area of high transposable element activity on the bronze gene. Uh, so the training method basically separates the sequence, converts it into Kamers, and I set it from five to 12, uh, and then it trains the network on aggregate embeddings, and it uses a two-layer neural network, which I explain in a second, and then it decomposes that model by the camera length. So what you get is basically giving it all this data at once, it breaks it down into itty bitty little pieces that you can then search through uh, and then train further. So the output from the DNA to vector is a word to vector format and I needed to break that into two different files for TensorFlow. Uh, I ran a Python script that basically turns it into two TSV files, one of the tensors and one of the actual cameras themselves. So using TensorFlow is a really cool way to see data on the downside, it's extremely dimensional data, but it can be uh, reduced using some of these formulas that it applies. Um, and it's extremely, extremely intense on a computer. So this is what it looks like when you upload all of these data points from the word to vector file into TensorFlow. And as you can see, you can search for the motif you're looking for. And this is actually highlighting all the nearest neighbor motifs that it found in context to the motif that you're looking for. So Let's, let's explain how that works. Um, it's trained on a skipgram. A skipgram basically, imagine you have a sentence and you want to find the context clues for each word in that sentence. You train the sentence and uh, it'll find, I have an example here, the context for each word in that sentence. And then when it sees enough of this data, it strongly associates the words. So instead of using words, imagine it's using these short little nucleotide camers and you basically train the data to look for these motifs you're looking for as a word in a camer, and then it can find the context within the whole genome. So interpreting this data, um, let me back up a little bit. Part of the reason why this is effective is that words that are highly seen around contexts, especially in the genome that are really long, useless repeats, they get filtered out because they're seen so much, they're a negative selection. In a sentence, imagine you see the word the a million times around different nouns. The word the doesn't tell you much about the noun, so it's filtered out. Same way with these large repeats, they get filtered out because they don't tell you much. 
The network trains faster and it finds interesting context for the motifs of size k, such as the examples, the motifs we're looking for. And so um, you can use this and it sniffs out the sequences that suggest the dissociation element insertion activity, even if the motifs aren't actually recognizable anymore through mutations. So part of the reason why this was difficult is because it's hugely dimensional data. So how do you take that data and make it clustered without losing any kind of the importance between the data relationships? Uh, you can use a TSNI calculation, a T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding, and it basically takes a huge 3D space of data and smushes it down into two dimensions, but keeps the important distances between all the points. So it's really complicated how it works. I can explain it very briefly. It basically takes every point, calculates it on a normal distribution, and makes a distance matrix, then unorganizes it, puts it on a number line, and then does a T-distribution, makes another matrix, and then matches the two matrices together. So you keep the distance, and it makes the data easier spaced apart without losing any kind of the relationship between the data. So unfortunately, it's not loading in this graphic, um, but it was I had an example of it loading and showing how it clusters the data. Oh, there we go. OK, there we, you can see it clustering. This is when I'm running the TSNI calculation based on searching and isolating the AAA CGG binding motif, and it clusters. Then after it clusters, you can go in and see what did it think was the context motifs you're looking for surrounding this AAA CGG motif uh, in the whole genome. So to kind of interpret this, you have to do an alignment. So I took all of the elements that I found in my database and I did a, a mega 10 alignment, untouched gapped alignment. So it basically takes the alignments, or excuse me, takes the sequences and lines them up based on how they kind of are related to each other. And so if we go back one slide, um, you can see when we find the motifs that are closest, it finds a motif that is CAC, excuse me, um, C-A-T-A-A-C. And so I was checking, OK, does it actually find a C-A-T-A-A-C around the binding motif? It does. It's right there. There's four of them. These are the binding motifs on two of the dissociation elements. And here's the context on two different ones. So it kind of tells us, OK, maybe these used to have the binding motifs here, but they mutated out, so you can never recognize them anymore. But now with context clues, we can know, hey, maybe we can find the motifs that weren't there before uh, using these contexts trained by the DNA Spectrum model. And the other cool thing is that I gave it the training data just from a portion of the B73 assembly. I didn't give it the data from the database. So it looked through the high uh, transposable element activity area and put together, OK, I saw this motif a lot. Search the data. It's a confirmation. Um, so I can skip through this quickly. I blasted a lot of these genes, uh, the, the regions, so that I could see what genes they're associated with. Um, and it basically just tells me based on how much of an, a similarity there is in the NCBI database. Um, I can skip through this, though. OK, so what that tells us, though, is that you can do a mega blast and take all of this data from the database and align it exactly where it lines up on the B73 maze assembly. And you can tell where each region is. Uh, so the last part of this that I wasn't able to accomplish yet is to train a simple vector machine. Um, and so, I'm oh, sorry, a support vector machine. This is a little more complicated. It's a computational algorithm that basically separates data based on context and based on things that are and things that aren't in that data. So for example, if you gave someone a, a axis and gave them bananas and, or and oranges and you said, OK, separate these into two groups and then draw a line between them. They would separate them into two groups and draw a straight line between them. It aims to have a linear division between two sets of data based on identifiers in the data. Um, so briefly, without over explaining, using the positive set of highly similar transposable element data and using a negative set of unlike transposable element data, you can train a kernel to be used in an SVM with test data. Um, so the, the first two are the training data. You train the SVM, and then you give it test data to compare it to and separate itself and see, OK, is this actually accurate? Does it actually separate the data based on the things we trained it to do? And if so, you can use that to teach a computer how to look at this transposable element data and see, this is a transposable element, this is not a transposable element, and separate it out itself using the context clue motifs that we discovered using the Python script. 
So there's a package for R that does this that I tried to use, and it didn't like my small data set, unfortunately. It was just too small for it, and I didn't have the computing power to use more. Uh, I did train 100 million different base pairs, and that data was just way too much for my computer and for using TensorFlow. Um, but the cool thing is that uh, you can use it instead of just for the potential dissociation element identification, you could probably use it for any mutable motif and any kind of uh, genome sequence. So to conclude of why this is all important, um, it helps you understand better the genomic history of, this, of these maize crops and where there were chromosomal breakages, um, phenotype emergence, speciation, mutation. That's what these dissociation elements tell us. They're found in all kinds of model organisms, rice, wheat, corn, and yeast. Uh, they can be used in yeast. And they transpose nearby genes so you can help to identify which genes were silenced or turned off. Some people believe that the dissociation element is a protection system against undesirable phenotypes. Um, and the other thing you can do if you don't use them is you can remove them. They're really just noise in a genome. If you're not looking for that, you can mask them out using this repeat masker algorithm. Um, but you can always update the library. If you truly find a useless dissociation element, um, if you update the repeat masker library with it, it'll better mask out genomic data of all the repeats for better, more interesting uh, applications of that data. So that was a lot to go through. I apologize. I know none of you are geneticists. Um, but I hope you kind of understood the data, or at least some of the visualizations. It was really cool. Um, I couldn't believe it was working. And it was, no one's used TensorFlow before to do this. So it was really newfangled and really neat to explore. Um, but I apologize for the load of information. And I hope if anyone understood it, if they have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Yeah. <coughs> so not so much about the, the, the data you got, because it did go over my head. Um, but like you said, this is you know new new uh, new way to use TensorFlow. Um, will you be like, are you able to publish any of this? Yes. Are you are you going to? I'm gonna try to see where I can publish it or take it to grad school. Um, it's really newfangled. I, don't, I couldn't find any kind of research of people using TensorFlow and Skipgrams to find context clue motifs around motifs that are mutated in an alignment. So it's pretty new. I'm shocked that it worked. It's awesome. Yeah, it was really cool. I was like, it really came together. <laughs> Oh no, yeah, I do. I cannot actually show you guys the data itself. That was one of the things I really wanted to do. It's so cool when you see it. Oh my god, I thought you were saying five. No, I really don't. I apologize about that. Oh, no worries. Oh, this is so cool. Okay. This will take me a sec. I can also show you the database if I, that will take long. Okay, so basically, I wrote this whole database just using R Shiny and Google Docs, and I, it's the coolest thing ever. Uh, <laughs> who knew you could use R shiny to literally? So taking an Excel sheet, um, you can just in about 80 lines of R shiny code make a database hosted completely online, and you can sort through the chromosomes and see. Okay, let's see what elements on chromosome eight are repetitive and are newly discovered, and there's six of them, and you get the code and all that. Um, you can sort it by each of the different kinds of elements that they found, DS1, DS2, DS3, DS4, like uh, and then the distribution. It basically just took the data and made it a lot more interactive, which I thought was so cool to do. And then uh, I can show you the actual projector TensorFlow. Let me load this data quickly. It uses sample data, but you can upload your own. And it's done in two of the files. There's a metadata and the tensors itself. So when you break it down from the word to vec, you get the metadata and the tensors. So let me upload the tensors. It has to like parse them. Maybe it already did. Okay, there we go. Okay, and then you give it the metadata, the actual cameras themselves, and it parses those. Okay, and what you get is this explosion of data 
And when you search for the motif you're looking for, in this case the transposase binding motif, A-A-A-C-G-G, you see all the ones highlighted that are its neighbors, and you can isolate them. So you get these isolated, so it's a lot easier to compute, and then you run a TSNI computation, and it basically just sorts them through, clusters them, and then you can zoom in and see, okay, which ones are the closest neighbors? And that's how I was able to find the context clue motifs in this whole genetic sequence. And you just made that? I didn't make this. I ran it. I, I coded it at first to make my own projector in Python, and it wasn't working. And then I found out Google has their own that you can just upload into. And I thought, saves me time. So when you see the, um, hang on, it's easier to see in 2D. So when you look and see it clustering, you can stop it. It takes a little bit to cluster, but you can see highlighted in pink is the element we're looking for. You just let it do, it, do its thing. It does a lot of computing. Uh, but this way, it's a lot easier for it to actually you know, choke down the data without actually choking. If you give it all 60,000 points at once, it's not good. It doesn't work well. Um, so it takes a little bit to cluster. But you can see it's clustering closer. And you can see really far away elements were not as near neighbors. For example, it did not see T, 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 A, A, T in context to the binding motif as often as it would the ones that are clustered close. So since it looks like it's done clustering, uh, like I did earlier, we can zoom in and we see which elements were nearby. Um, and it's kind of dependent on how long you let the TSNI run for. It clusters better the longer you let it run, but after a while, it's less effective. So it's up for a little bit of randomization. I just got lucky, too, that I found a motif context clue that just happened to be really near a binding site on another alignment, which was a little mind-blowing. But yeah, now that you see the data, when you actually interact with it, it makes a little more sense, even if the math behind it is a little overwhelming. Um, I have a couple more minutes, so let me see. We can also do it with a different motif. Um, or for example, if you go back, you can show all the data again, and then you can search for like, there's a, a motif called a, a THTA box, a TATA box, that is indicative of another kind of um, uh, binding site that's really kind of commonplace inside a genome. So if we, for example, isolate these points, run a TSNI, it'll show how often it sees a motif around a TATA box in a genome. Uh, how well it works, actually, would have to be explored more with a bigger training set. I was kind of bummed I wasn't able to use all 100 million base pairs, because then it would take, basically picture this algorithm reading a book and getting the context clues for how often it sees certain words and associating with other words. The more data you give it, the better it associates throughout the whole genome okay, this is near this, this is near this, this is often near this, which just gives us more clues to actually go back and find these super mutated motifs that suggest an insertion site of the dissociation element. Uh, it's just so neat, though. For such big data to be able to be played with like this was mind-blowing. It really is big data. I would show you the whole genome, but it was like, imagine just 25 million different letters, A, T, C, G, A, all just in a huge box. So being able to break it down into something you can actually understand better and in new ways was so cool. Um, I can just let this run. But as you see, it just really is a new way to use this data in a way that's never been used before. Uh, I have one minute. So if anyone has any other questions about it, I'd be happy to take them. Or any kind of clarifications. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so just going back to your database, so you said that it was just an Excel file and R code and it was hosted completely. Yeah, if you upload Excel. the Excel file as a CSV on Google Sheets and publish it to the web, it gives you a link. So I just call them that link in R. So I don't actually actually excuse me, I don't actually have to keep the files locally. It's all uploaded onto the R server I'm using. And which that's is like publicly accessible. Yeah, if you, yep. if you type in the link if you just type in my link here, I'm, I can host it anywhere, really. But yeah, it's publicly accessible. Yeah, it was really cool. That was like the easiest part of this assignment, too, or this whole project, I guess. It was neat. And then here's like the information. And you can actually go to the, uh, the actual, here we go. This is just their article and about everything that they did to find these elements. It's not that exciting to look at. But here's like what they found in terms of how these elements look and behave. It was really cool. Thanks, everyone.